हेलो वेलकम टू यूनिट सेवन चैप्टर सेवन प्रोबिटी इन गवर्नेंस प्रोबिटी इन गवर्नेंस इज एन एसेंशियल रिक्वायरमेंट फॉर एन एफिशिएंट एन इफेक्टिव सिस्टम ऑफ गवर्नेंस द इंपॉर्टेंट रिक्विजिट of property in governance is the absence of corruption the other requirements are the effective laws rules and regulations governing every aspect of public life a public service is a service the government provides to people within its jurisdiction civil service refers to the body of government officials employed in civil occupation that are neither political nor judicial it is independent of both politics and judiciary the concept of civil service again became prominent when the british in search of creating a framework to hold the territories of india met the much coveted indian civil service icas the importance of the civil service to governance stems from the service presence throughout the country and it's a strong binding character information sharing and transparency in government are the philosophical basis of governance and probity what is this stewardship a stewardship and its fullness are principles of information sharing a stewardship focuses on assuring accuracy validity security management and preservation of information holdings this fullness means that the content of the information is helpful beneficial and serviceable to its intended users now this fullness enhances public access to government information encourages public private information partnership and makes possible the combination or reuse of information for new purposes this is how usefulness works the right to receive and impart information has been held to be a part of the freedom of a speech and expression guaranteed by the law this right to information which is available the right modes of information are a speech media movies and advertisements the department of administrative reforms of the government of india had prepared a code of ethics for public services in a conference of chief ministers presided over by the prime minister in may 1997 the code of conduct said that public servants should provide services to the public without taking any return from them this is the provision and instruction made in this public in this code of ethics and code of conduct 
Now, employees, employees in public services should uphold the rule of law and respect human rights and act solely in a public interest. This is how code of conduct instructs and works. To what extent should public servant respect the policies of the government? They should not seek to frustrate or undermine the government's policies and actions taken in a public interest by declining or abstaining from activity. So public servants should maintain their independence, dignity, and impartiality by not approaching politicians and outsiders concerning service matters or for private benefits. Public servants should have concern for public assets and funds, avoid wastage and extravagance and ensure effective and efficient use of public money within their control. Because as we have seen, they are supposed to be the trustee of these funds and power. The second initiative for the Public Service Code of Ethics was taken in 2006 by the Department of Personnel. Public servants are guided by the allegiance of public servants to the Constitution and the law. Public servants should act objectively, impartially, honestly, equitably, and in a fair and just manner. Public servants should establish high standards and ensure quality service effective working and prompt decision making. Merit becomes the fundamental principles in the employment, promotion, and placement of public servants. Merit becomes important. The second administrative reforms commission in its fourth report, 2007 holds that the crux of ethical behavior does not lie in bold words, but in their adoption in action, in a sanction against a violation. In its wide-ranging recommendations, it has suggested partial state funding of elections, and tightening of anti-defection laws and code of ethics for ministers, legislators, judiciary, and civil servants. ARC recommends a steps to contain corruption by recommending the Prevention of Corruption Act making corrupt public servants liable for damage, confiscation of property, illegally acquired, and speedy trials. Here are the provisions there. Now, ARC recommended an anti-corruption act to investigate the charges made against ministers. The ARC in its 10th report on personal administration had re-emphasized the need for prescribing the code of ethics should include integrity, impartiality, commitment to public service and open accountability. An essential dimension a probity in governance is work culture. 
it represents a commitment to the fulfillment of one's official responsibilities with a spirit of dedication, involvement, and sincerity. The hallmark of good governance is efficiency, productivity, and punctuality. Efficiency implies doing one's best in one's job with a concern for the maximum possible utilization of human and financial resources. The major factor behind the poor quality of output of public systems is the carelessness and colossusness on the part of the government functionaries. In order to improve the quality of work, culture, and delivery of services, to the public, a specific productivity and work performance norms should be prescribed to organizational units and individuals. Now, a comprehensive and inclusive performance appraisal system should be adopted. Punctuality and promptness in administration affairs must be valued along with the quality of work performance. These should become the criteria for reward and punishment in organizations. In India, one of the sources of funding for political parties has been through private donations. In minimalist pattern, there are different patterns for this short of you know donation or help or funding. In minimalist patterns, elections are partially funded by the government. The maximalist, the maximalist pattern involves public funding, not merely for elections but even for other activities as we find in Sweden and Germany. Mixed patterns involving partial reimbursement for public funding of elections on a matching grant basis, such as in France, Netherlands, and South Korea. The Danish Goswami Committee on Electoral Reforms set up in 1990 recommended limited support in kind for vehicle fuel, higher charges of microphones, copies of electoral rolls, etc., while simultaneously recommending a ban on company donations. No company donations recommended by the Dinesh Goswami Committee. The Indrajit Gupta Committee on state funding of elections recommended partial state funding, mainly in kind. Dr. Manmohan Singh's committee on party finances was set up in 2002. Dr. Manmohan committee recommended full tax exemption to individuals and companies on all contributions in political to political parties. It also recommended disclosure of party finances and contribution over rupees 20,000. Corruption means to resolve the conflict of interest in one's favor. A scope for corruption increases when 
the control of the public administration is fragile and the power between political, executive, and bureaucracy is ambiguous. The relation among them is ambiguous. Political corruption, which is sometimes inseparable from bureaucratic crime, bureaucratic crime, tending widespread in authoritarian regimes and takes a place where public opinions and the presence of the denounced corruption. India is raised, rated. India is rated 73 out of 99 countries. In the Corruption Perception Index, prepared by a non-governmental organizations, by a non-governmental organizations, Transparency International. The case of India's exceptionally high index of corruption is due to utter insensitivity, lack of shame, and the absence of any sense of public morality among public servants. In India, corruption has flourished because one does not see adequately successful examination, effectively prosecuted cases of corruption. This became important region. According to Margaret, Indian society is a soft society because politicians do not have the political will to enact the laws necessary for its progress and development. It is just because of this that Indian society is called a soft society. According to Mardell, discipline can reduce corruption to a great extent because corruption and indiscipline fit upon each other. According to late Mahbubul Haq, the characteristic of corruption in South Asia <coughs> Sorry. Including India occurs upstream, not downstream. Higher officials they take bribes. Their corruption light. Again, according to the late Mabul Haq, the second characteristic of corruption in South Asia had wings, not wheels. Why? Because whatever they earn on account of corruption, they send eh, that funds in foreign countries. So, most of the corrupt gains made in the region are immediately smuggled out to safe heavens abroad. According to late Mahul Haq, company in South Asia, including India, often leads a promotion, not a prison. A corrupt man is promoted most of the time. Not prison. The big fish, unless he belongs to opposition, rarely prime. According to late Mahbubul Haq, Corruption in South Asia occurs with 515 million people in poverty, not with per capita incomes above $20,000. According to late Mehbubul Haq, there are two dimensions of corruption. One is exploitive corruption where the public servant exploits the helpless poor citizens. The other is 
collusive corruption where the citizen corrupts the public servant with a bribe. This became because he gets financially better benefits. People give bribes to public servants. Collusive co corruption depends on black money. So this collusiveness, that becomes also an important factor. The first measure taken by India to ensure property in governance is to enforce Section 5 of the Benami Transaction Prohibition Act 1988. Benami Transaction means any transaction in which property is transferred to one person for a consideration paid or provided by another person. In the Benami Transaction Act, all properties held by Benami shall be subject to acquisition by authority in such a manner and after following such procedures as may be prescribed. Now, Ms. Pearson's is another special measure to ensure probity in governance. Ms. Pearson's provides that if a public servant abuses his office, either by an act of omission or commission, and the consequence of that is an injury to an individual or loss of public property, an action may be maintained against such a public servant. One of the measures adopted in India to fight corruption and maladministration enactment of the Public Interest Disclosure Act, popularly called the Visual Lower Act. Lokapal Act is another major for ensuring probity in governance. Under Lokpal Act, complaints could be made against the union ministers and union civil servants. Lokpal was thought of a single member body that could be described roughly as personal, would combine in himself the functions of an ombudsman as known to the Western countries and the function of the Central Vigilance Commission. It is combined with this, the Central Vigilance Commission. The directions of the Supreme Court, look, the directions of the Supreme Court determine the appointment, powers, and functioning of CBC, CBI, and ED, all designed to insulate the set institutions from political control and to invest them with a good amount of independence coupled with accountability. So see, this is how these different bodies are controlled and supervised. The Civil Services Commission Board was constituted to look after the misuse of power by bureaucrats. Another commission is Civil Service Commission. The Prime Minister heads it and its direction is restricted to certain high-level posts in the bureaucracy. So, we have seen that how, in order to maintain probity in governance, different aspects are important. And the most important aspect is the absence of corruption. And second, most important, as we have seen, is to follow laws and rules. So, now with this, 
I'm going to close my this presentation. Thanks.